Okay, so uh, Eric comes to us from UC Santa Cruz, where he's a, a professor there, uh, developing a bunch of exciting new systems. Before that, he was a visiting professor at Duke University. And before that, he was a PhD student at Yale University. Before, ah, he was a postdoc at the <laughs> University of Maine. So he has a convoluted academic career, and I'm going in reverse order, which is really difficult for me. Maybe I should go in forward order. Okay, What's he his undergrad at Michigan. Then he did his master's at Yale, working on the conservation genetics of uh, giant tortoises on Aldabra Island. Cool, man. The rest of it's boring after that. <laughs> uh, then he did a PhD uh, also at Yale, where he worked with David Post, and that is where he started working on eco-evolutionary dynamics. And the work that he did on alewives there, which we'll hear a bit about, uh, is really sort of the foundational work for uh, the animal side of eco-evolutionary dynamics. So Eric was one of the first people in that field, and he's done the definitive work uh, up to this point. Uh, from there, he went to do a postdoc with more eco evo stuff with Mike Kinnison at Maine. And at Maine, uh, he was starting to work on the Trinidadian eco evo system. Then from there, he went to Duke, and now he's a professor at UC Santa Cruz, where he continues to look at uh, eco evo type questions. So I've known Eric since his PhD when I was on his committee, and despite my efforts to uh, get him to fail, um, the other committee's over, committee members overrode me, uh, and as a result, we now have a, an emerging superstar within the eco-evo world. And uh, so he's going to tell us all about how all this ties together in the context of uh, aquatic communities and ecosystems. All right, thanks Andrew. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. There's a lot of familiar faces around here. I'll take the opportunity now because I, uh, so I don't forget at the end to thank QCBS funding actually for some of the things that I'm going to talk about. So um, we, Andrew and I co-organized a working group on eco-evolutionary dynamics. We had a couple of great meetings. Um, one here, uh, or up at Mont Saint Hilaire, and then a second one. Um, <laughs> At a winery in Napa, which was one of the more <laughs> difficult working groups I've ever um, been to, but it ended up being pretty productive, uh, and so thanks to QCBS for that. So today what I'm really going to talk um, a lot about is um, the effects that intraspecific variation can have on aquatic communities and ecosystems. Okay, So the traditional way, really, ecologists have thought about um, the, uh, the way the communities and ecosystems are structured from a consumer perspective uh, relates to the effects that individual species might have, okay? So one of the first um, things to be sort of uh, discovered or, or made noteworthy is that predator presence can make a really big difference for the way that aquatic communities and ecosystems function. Go back to a time in aquatic ecology when uh, bottom-up processes were really thought to dominate aquatic systems. And then a series of studies um, came along and showed that the presence or absence of predators makes a huge difference, right? It can really, um, with, with sort of the, the um, movement of trophic cascade theory and, and the, the um, sort of general uh, theories surrounding that gaining momentum, after people really started to appreciate that the presence of predators matters, um, then ecologists started to think a little bit more about which predators you have, okay? And so this, we think about predator identity. So do you have a largemouth bass as your top predator or a bluegill sunfish as your top predator? And what difference does that make? It turns out um, ecologists have shown repeatedly that that does make a big difference. The different species feed in different ways, use different habitat, and therefore have different effects in structuring communities and ecosystems. Back, as Andrew mentioned, when I started my PhD, I was particularly um, interested in whether uh, variation below the species level might have important ecological effects, okay? So intraspecific effects. So might variation below the level of species matter? And you can think about several sources of this variation. One is population diversity. So in other words, if you were to take a population of largemouth bass from pond A versus a population of largemouth bass from pond B, do they play essentially an equivalent ecological role, or might there be differences between those populations that might have important effects on how those communities and ecosystems are structured? And then, of course, 
phenotypic change, right? We know that those population level differences came from somewhere, right? And um, oftentimes those differences were evolved, have evolved in contemporary time, and we can think about how then contemporary evolution uh, and contemporary phenotypic change generally um, might impact communities and ecosystems through these uh, intraspecific differences in, in consumers. So this is what I'm going to talk to you, uh, talk to you about a little bit today. Okay, so I'm going to ask two principal questions. The first one is, does intraspecific consumer diversity have important ecological effects? Simply, um, are those effects um, detectable and how important are they? And then second, quantitatively ask the question, how do these effects measure up to species level effects? So if we're trying to make the argument in eco-evolutionary dynamics, that intraspecific variation matters, or contemporary trait change matters for communities and ecosystems, we kind of need a measuring stick, right? We need something to compare those effects against. And uh, what we've chosen to use here is, it, is those species effects, which ecologists have already recognized and appreciate as important. So we're gonna do some, uh, some quantitative uh, comparisons between the strengths of intra and species effects, okay? And as Andrew mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, a couple of systems specifically, and then a meta-analysis. And this meta-analysis, in particular, um, is part of um, the, the, uh, what was produced um, from this uh, QCBS working group. Okay, so I'll start by talking about uh, alewife in North American lakes. Um, it's a iconic system for understanding the importance of uh, predator presence absence, okay, going back to the work of Brooks and Dodson. Um, and then we investigated the importance of intraspecific variation in alewife for structuring uh, lake zooplankton and phytoplankton communities. Then I'll move on to um, work we did uh, with guppies in Trinidadian streams. And sort of in contrast to the historical importance of alewife as an ecological system, Many of you know Trinidadian guppies are a fairly iconic system in evolutionary biology. So we have sort of one traditionally important sort of ecological system we'll look at, one that's more representative of, of a classic evolutionary system. Um, and then I'll move on to this meta-analysis where we try to do is to gather as many uh, data from as many experiments as possible that manipulated intra and inter-specific effects and ask about the relative magnitude of those effects across a variety of aquatic consumers, okay? All right, so if I can take you back to your qualifying exam, if you're a professor, or maybe this is your life right now, if you're a graduate student, um, you probably have been asked to take a look at this book, Foundations of Ecology, and if you haven't, then Andrew and Andy aren't doing their jobs, but I'm sure they are doing their jobs, and that you have looked at Foundations of Ecology, and if you have, um, you probably have noticed this paper here. So by Brooks and Dodson, predation, body size, um, and the composition of plankton. Um, I had sort of the honor of working with Stanley Dodson on some of this work. He unfortunately passed away in 2009 um, in an untimely way. So um, some of this work is um, in his memory and sort of in, in his inspiration. Okay. But this is a very classic example of the effects predators can have on prey communities. Okay. Going back to this work that Stan Dodson actually did when he was an undergraduate at Yale. So the Brooks and Dodson study was important because they showed really strong effects of alewife presence or absence on the structure of the zooplankton community in Connecticut lakes. So this is a figure from Brooks and Dodson's paper. So we have a variety of lakes spread across Connecticut. And in some of these lakes that Brooks and Dodson sampled, there's no alewife populations present. And in other lakes, alewives are present in those lakes. And so they asked about the zooplankton community composition across those different lakes. And they found this really, really strong effect. If landlocked alewives were present in these lakes, the lake community was dominated by small-bodied zooplankton, like these Bosmina. In lakes that did not have alewife uh, as a top planktivore, we had large-bodied zooplankton, such as these Daphnia, okay? Brooks and Dodson didn't stop there, right? They actually took advantage of an experiment 
where alewives were introduced to Crystal Lake, um, and they observed they had data from before that introduction, and they compared that to data from after that introduction. So before the introduction of alewife to Crystal Lake in 1942, they sampled the lake and saw zo zooplankton body size distribution uh, that was relatively large body, where we have large body copepods, large body cladocerans like Daphnia. Um, and other relatively large zooplankton present in the lake. Alewives were introduced, and after that introduction, Brooks and Dodson noted this dramatic decrease in the body size distribution of the zooplankton community. We no longer have these large bodied zooplankton present. Now the, the largest zooplankton are about one millimeter, whereas in the, in the lake before we had zooplankton that were larger than this. And Brooks and Dodson ascribe this effect to the size selective pl planktivity of, of alewife. Okay? They're swimming around the lake, selectively consuming the largest zooplankton in the lake. All right? So, why is alewife such an effective planktivore? Well, Brooks and Dodson, this figure is another figure from their paper, and they point to the importance of these structures, gill rakers. Okay? And here they're contrasting alewife gill rakers to that of another species in the genus that consumes small fish. And you can see that, their point is that, these really tightly spaced gill rakers are very efficient at feeding on, very, uh, on zooplankton, whereas these uh, less densely spaced gill rakers are more efficient at feeding at lar on larger prey, like small fish. Okay? So, now we have a structure, right, of the alewife as suggested by Brooks and Dodson to start thinking about when we start thinking about phenotypic variation, okay? And this work um, led to sort of the designation of alewife as a keystone species, or in that suite of, of, of species that we think of as having extremely strong ecological effects, right? And this paper challenges in the quest for keystones, um, this group of uh, ecologists suggest different species that might play that keystone role, and in fact, based on the work of Brooks and Dodson, alewife is, is a member of that list, okay? So when, when I started working in this system, the thing that, uh, that David Post and I were most intrigued about is what Brooks and Dodson didn't think about, and that is that in Connecticut lakes, there's not just one type of alewife, okay? The landlocked alewives that Brooks and Dodson paid attention to are one of two life history forms that occur in these systems. The other form is anadromous. So landlocked alewives spend their whole life cycle in the freshwater lake. Anadromous alewives, they spawn in those lakes. The young rear in those lakes for the summer, but then the young take off. They grow to maturity in the marine environment, and then they migrate back up to their natal lake as adults to spawn. And so they don't co-occur in the same lakes, so lakes in Connecticut actually occur in three different states with respect to alewife presence. We have lakes that have no alewife at all. We have lakes that have landlocked alewife. Those are, would be the set that Brooks and Dodson looked at. And we have lakes that have anadromous alewife. And Brooks and Dodson did not consider any lakes that have anadromous alewife, okay? One of the first questions we wanted to know was, sort of what is the evolution of this landlocked form? We presume that this anadromous form is the ancestral form and that they had colonized these lakes and that these landlocked forms um, were descendant populations. Um, but when that transition happened, um, we weren't entirely sure until we did some genetic work and then later some uh, paleolimnology work that points very strongly to the fact that these lakes were isolated by these dams that were built on coastal Connecticut streams um, early in the European colonization process uh, of sort of the, 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 generate, the settlers that first colonized these systems, um, built these dams to power their grist mills and such, and then that looks like it led to the evolution of these landlocked alewife populations, okay? So they're of relatively recent evolutionary origin. They're not post-glacial or anything like that. So when we started, I, I wanted to ask the question, well, first of all, from a, the standpoint of contemporary evolution or understanding uh, contemporary trade changes with respect to something that is uh, ecologically important aspect of their morphology, 
Um, I wanted to ask the question, are they different? Do we see differences, intraspecific differences, in an ecologically important trait? And of course, at Brooks and Dodson's suggestion, I looked at gill rakers, okay? So this right here is the mouth of an alewife, which would be sort of the nightmare of a Daphnia, right? This is what Daphnia stay awake at night, <laughs> fearing, right? Because this means it's over for you if you're Daphnia. And you see that anadromous alewives, the differences between the two life history forms are really pretty dramatic, right? You can even see them with your, with your naked eye. Anadromous alewives have these much more um, widely spaced rakers. The rakers are shorter and they're much sort of uh, stiffer, whereas here we have in landlocked alewife really densely packed rakers. And we have long feathery rakers. And these two different morphologies to, to a fish biologist looks like this is something that would facilitate consuming the very smallest zooplankton. Whereas is it the same morph difference in morphology if the two fish don't, the two groups don't coexist? They don't coexist, right? They occur in two different sets of lakes. Okay. Okay. They we don't have cases where they coexist actually, which is an interesting twist compared to some other anatomous landlocked systems where they do coexist. In this case, we don't see them coexist. Okay, so we see these differences in, in morphology, right? And we see these differences uh, are pretty consistent across a suite of lakes we sampled. So we have three lakes that have anadromous populations that we sample, measured uh, gill raker spacing. This is a body size uh, standardized measure of gill raker spacing. And we can see that all these landlocked populations have much smaller gill raker spacing. Um, we also went back to Crystal Lake which you'll recall was this population that Brooks and Dodson looked at that drove this dramatic size reduction in the zooplankton community. And I, uh, at, the, at the University of Connecticut Museum, I actually found a collection from right after when those alewives were introduced to Crystal Lake, okay? Right after that introduction, Crystal Lake looked pretty similar to anadromous alewives. And in fact, Brooks and Dodson report that population as having been introduced to Crystal Lake from the Connecticut River. So it would have historically been an anadromous population. By 2005 samples we took, it's essentially uh, similar to those other landlocked populations. Okay? So this population looks like, over this time interval that we measured here, looks like it's changed pretty dramatically in its gill raker spacing. Right? So we have these two different um, suites now of foraging traits. We want to ask something about their consequences. So we did a bunch of diet studies that I'm not going to talk too much about, but that basically support the hypothesis that the anadromous uh, alewife gill rakers are more efficient at consuming larger bodied zooplankton, and the landlocked alewife gill rakers are more efficient at feeding it on, sm on small bodied zooplankton. So we confirmed that. And then we wanted to do an experiment to ask, what are the ecological consequences then? Do anadromous alewives and landlocked alewives have different effects on aquatic communities and ecosystems, or are they essentially equivalent, as classic ecological theory would suggest? Same species, same effect, right? So what we did is we did a mesocosm experiment. So we put these um, lake mesocosms, these are essentially closed polyethylene bags um, suspended Right? These were deep enough, five meters deep, so they actually uh, penetrate the um, thermocline. Right? They go deep enough to actually penetrate the thermocline. So zooplankton in these bags do essentially have some access to a refuge right, down at the thermocline. Um, and we stocked them at the beginning of the, uh, of the summer with these young of the year anadromous or landlocked alewives, or no alewives. And we watched those systems develop over the summer. This is a technical question. Um, can David teach people how to do field work with their hands in their pockets? That's his normal <coughs> phenotype. <laughs> yeah, so the hardworking graduate student, in this case me, is doing the, the bucket work, and David, Yale professor as he is, is supervising to make sure, I guess, that I don't scoop fish the wrong way. Okay. Okay, so we ran that experiment throughout the summer, and this is what we see. So here we have uh, zooplankton length here, mean zooplankton length, 
Here we have our three treatments. We have no alewife, landlocked alewife, and anadromous alewife. And as you can see, right away, anadromous alewife have this extremely strong effect on the community. They consume the largest zooplankton and cause this dramatic, rapid decrease in average zooplankton body size. Okay? The effect of landlocked alewives is in the same direction, right? But it is much less dramatic. And in fact, by the end of this experiment, we still retain somewhat larger uh, body size zooplankton community in the landlocked lakes, uh, in the landlocked mesocosms compared to the anadromous mesocosms. And of course, the, the mesocosms with no alewife um, all retain the, the large zooplankton that can actually continue to exist in those sort of confined environments. Okay? And if we look at statistically, we can see that, in fact, landlocked and anadromous alewife mesocosms in this case are significantly different from one another. We can also look at something like zooplankton biomass. Okay? Again, anadromous alewife drive this really dramatic, rapid sort of um, decrease in zooplankton biomass. Again, they're, they're really selective, right? They have those, those gill rakers that are fairly widely spaced, okay? So they're feeding quite selectively on these largest zooplankton. They're just eating the big things that they can identify, and they're really constrained in the sense that they're very inefficient at eating the small zooplankton, okay? So they're eating the big things, and they're therefore decreasing zooplankton length and decreasing zooplankton biomass. <clears throat> yeah. And landlocks have a much less dramatic effect. Okay? So these differences, we thought, well, we have now potentially you know, these changes in the zooplankton community. We know that large-bodied zooplankton are more efficient consumers of phytoplankton than small-bodied zooplankton. So this raised the possibility that, in fact, these two different life history forms of alewife might be um, changing the strength of the trophic cascade, right? From planktivore to zooplankton to phytoplankton, all right? With anadromous alewife potentially driving a stronger cascade because they're removing more of those large body zooplankton that are the most efficient feeders on phytoplankton. Okay, so here just is a sort of cartoon of your classic species presence trophic cascade, right? Here, on the left side, we have no planktivores. We have a lake that only has zooplankton. Of course, it has these large-bodied zooplankton like Daphnia, and they're decreasing the abundance of phytoplankton. In a classic predator presence cascade, you add a planktivore. Planktivore selectively consumes the efficient uh, zooplankton grazers and you see a trophic cascade that results in an increase in phytoplankton, okay? Sort of the classic species presence trophic cascade. Here what we're asking is, is there the possibility that intraspecific differences within the population of, uh, or, or within the species alewife, right, might have similar effects that are driven by differences in the way that these populations feed, right? So anadromous ale, uh, landlocked alewives in this case are feeding on small things, thereby allowing some of the larger things to continue to persist, whereas anadromous alewife is consuming all the large-bodied zooplankton, therefore dramatically reducing zooplankton biomass and body size, and potentially driving a stronger cascade. Okay? So this is what we wanted to ask. So we went out to natural lakes, and we measured chlorophyll A and spring total phosphorus as a, as a covariate. across a suite of lakes, many of which are the same lakes that Brooks and Dodson looked at. And in fact, we do see this predicted pattern, okay? Anadromous alewives seem to drive the strongest cascade. No alewife lakes, of course, they have large-bodied zooplankton life. Daphne are very abundant in the no alewife lakes. We know that from Brooks and Dodson, right? Um, and landlocked alewife are somewhere in the middle, driving intermediately, um, a cascade of intermediate strength. And importantly, the differences here between the anadromous and the landlocked lakes are about of the same uh, magnitude as the difference between the no alewife lakes and the landlocked lakes. So this difference in feeding, this difference in morphology, this difference in feeding behavior seems to result in a difference in the zooplankton community, which then in turn seems to result in a difference in the strength of the cascade. Okay, so this is sort of my now conceptualization of how the system works. We have a lake that has full of all different body sizes of zooplankton, and our alewives come munching their way through the system. 
And as they munch their way through the system, the anadromous ones eat all the big zooplankton, leaving only the small. The landlocked alewives eat some of the big, but they can also eat the small. So they also consume some of the small. And differences in this pattern of feeding results in a strong cascade for anadromous and a much weaker cascade for landlocked. And importantly, from the work in Crystal Lake, right, that shows that these gillraker differences can evolve relatively quickly, in as few as 30 generations in this case, we can see that this sort of cascade of ecological consequences might conceivably happen relatively quickly, right? That, that contemporary trade change might actually be changing the ecological role of alewife life um, literally in, in a lifetime, right? In a human lifetime, which is, which is, which is an interesting, uh, interesting result, okay? Switching gears a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about work on, on the guppy system, okay? So many of you know a lot about the guppy system, and I'll try not to belabor the point, but in order to simply describe the system for those that may not, um, in Trinidadian um, streams in the Northern Rain, Range Mountains, right, classic system for studying life history evolution and color evolution, we have predator communities characterized by either piscivorous fishes in streams that are below these barrier waterfalls, or this competitor, weak predator called rivulus that occur um, above these barrier waterfalls at these low predation sites. Okay, and these, uh, the, the morphological features and the color patterns of these guppies have been studied a lot, right? So we know that in low predation sites, guppies uh, are colorful, males display vigorously, whereas in high predation sites, males are much less colorful um, because the more colorful they are, the more they get consumed by visual predators. All right, so this is the system. And the one feature of this system that makes it particularly interesting is our ability to, again, do, do experiments, right? So like Brooks and Dodson, we used the introduction to a lake in Connecticut as an experiment in contemporary evolution. Now, uh, these guppy systems are classic experimental systems where John Endler, David Resnick more recently, have done introductions above barrier waterfalls, taking guppies from high predation sites and relocating them to low predation sites, or sites that have only rivulets, okay? So there's a, this classic introduction that Endler did in 1976 in the Aripo River that's yielded some very influential papers by Endler and by Resnick and Endler about how life history traits and color patterns evolve in contemporary time. We went back to this introduction site, okay, and we wanted to ask, how has trophic morphology changed in contemporary time at this site? Okay, we know that this population has evolved in other ways. Has it evolved in any ways that might impact the ecological role of the guppies in these different systems? Okay, so here we looked at, we cleared and stained guppies from the site that Endler introduced fish to, the site that Endler took those fish originally from, the high predation site, and then another low predation site that was either that was even further upstream. Okay, and we use geometric morphometrics to look at differences in, in cranial um, and premaxillary uh, structure, right? So here I would offer a warning to those doing morphology is to measure spacing between gill rakers. Don't clear and stain guppy heads, okay? This is, was much more challenging to do, right? A lot of structural complexity here. It's not quite so simple as the distance between gill rakers. But it yielded a pretty interesting result. We also, in tandem, ran a set of um, uh, trials, feeding trials, to ask about the consumption rates of these guppies before we measured their morphology, okay? So for every guppy in this experiment, taken from one of these sites, we have a feeding rate, and we have a head shape score, okay? These, what we found was that certain head shapes were associated with lower consumption rates, okay? So a very thick premaxilla and a very um, long cranium were associated with low consumption rates, whereas this thin premaxilla and this relatively compressed cranium were associated with higher feeding rates. Perhaps even more interestingly, we found a pattern with respect to where those fish came from. So the high predation fish tended to have 
head shapes that were like this and relatively low feeding rates. Low predation fish tended to have these thin premaxilla and relatively high feeding rates. In sites that were taken from the Endler introduction, uh, guppies taken from the Endler introduction sites were intermediate between those two. Okay, so there seems to now be an association between guppy cranial morphology and feeding rate, and that seems to have something to do with the population of origin, with low predation fish consuming prey at a higher rate. We also looked at um, guppy body shape, and we found a similar result. Okay, guppies. With, high with low consumption rates tended to be from high predation sites and show these uh, thin body shapes, small head, long kind of uh, robust caudal peduncle, whereas low, uh, guppies from these low predation populations tended to have deep bodies, bigger heads, shorter caudal peduncles, and the introduction site fish had intermediate feeding rates and tended to fall in between these two extremes um, in terms of their body shapes and feeding rates. Okay. This sort of difference here had been noted before with respect to adaptation to avoid predators, right? In terms of fast start uh, burst uh, swimming speed performance, here we show that it also seems to be related to, to feeding rates also, which is an interesting result. Okay? So now we have some possible traits that might link intraspecific variation in guppies to some ecological effects. There are also another suite of traits that had already been very well described in guppies that could potentially be related to uh, ecological differences, and that is these life history traits. Okay, so as most of you know, high predation guppy populations they mature um, at an early age, uh, at a small size, right? They have more smaller clutches, more offspring per clutch, and more frequent clutches. Whereas low predation sites, they mature later, they mature at a larger size, they have fewer offspring per clutch, and they have less frequent clutches. Okay, these, these, uh, re these results sort of are supported across systems and from experimental introductions where we see uh, high predation uh, fish introduced to low predation sites evolving this suite of traits um, fairly rapidly. Well, so how could that be important for ecology? Why would these life history traits be important for ecological interaction?